It is Tuesday and welcome back to the How to Life podcast. How are you all doing today? I'm Dr. Laura Jagged, and I want to thank you for listening to my show. And this one is episode 98. We are talking about mental health today and how to overcome things that may be holding you back from being the best version of you. There are many ways to achieve good mental health. There are many different types of therapies and different things work for different people. I'd like to offer this other therapy that you may not have known about, and I didn't know much about it myself before this interview. It is called EMDR therapy, and it is incredibly effective. Rotem Brayer is a certified EMDR therapist and the founder of the Art and Science of EMDR, a platform designed to educate EMDR therapists, and he is in private practice in Denver, Colorado as well. He's here to answer my questions about this particular therapy. This is a very good summary that'll help you learn more about it and see if it's something that you might want to pursue. You never know. This could be the answer you've been looking for. Hi, Rotem. Welcome back to the How to Life podcast. Thank you very much for coming back on to talk about EMDR this time. My pleasure, Laura. So for those of you who remember a few weeks ago, we did an interview with Rotem and we were talking about habits, creating habits. And then at the end, we sort of touched upon what his specialty is, which is a particular type of therapy called EMDR. And that's what we're going to be talking about. We didn't have enough time to go into it last time. And I promised we'd bring him back. So here he is again. Rotem, before we start, please reintroduce yourself and tell everyone about you and what you do. Yeah, I'm. Uh, my name is Rotem Breyer. I'm a psychotherapist uh, in Denver, Colorado, and my specialty is EMDR, uh, EMDR therapy, which stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. And no need to be overwhelmed by the scary name. Basically, EMDR is it's a very different type of psychotherapy than most therapies that people are familiar with until they do EMDR. So instead of talking and using what therapists call top-down approach, so top to bottom, using our thoughts to change our emotions and body sensations, in EMDR we're doing both top-down and bottom-up. So bottom-up meaning using body sensations, using thoughts and emotions to change whatever brought the client into our therapy room. Now, it has more of a scientific basis than hypnosis or positive affirmations or anything like that. So what is not EMDR? So EMDR is is not a lot of things. For example, you know, one of the main competitors, I think, for EMDR is CBT or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, which is a very well-researched approach, but it uses only the top-down approach. So again, you know, the, the premise of cognitive behavioral therapy is that if you change your thoughts, then you will change your emotions. And in reality, you know, we know that it's not always that easy and we're not that linear. We're not that rational as we would like to think. So it's not that we can, you know, just make a decision to change our thoughts. And then as a result, you know, our emotions change. What a lot of therapists know is that sometimes we need to access the raw emotions, or sometimes emotions are manifested as body sensations, especially when when we were going into early childhood trauma and and experiences that happen earlier in life, sometimes even pre-verbally. So before a person can remember, with EMDR, we have ways, very effective ways, in fact, to process these memories and change them. Explain to me a little bit more. There's a physiological response that needs to be addressed or at least monitored. And EMDR can do that. Is that correct? Yeah. So first of all, we have very specific protocols when it comes to, you know, the examples that you brought up, like smoking and overeating and addictions. 
But EMDR that was originally developed in 1987 by Francine Shapiro was originally targeted to help people with post-traumatic stress disorder. So people with all kinds of trauma. That's the origin of EMDR. Now we have research that shows that it can help a variety of diagnoses and conditions. But what we have with EMDR that we don't have with a lot of types of therapies is that we can directly access the emotions and we can process them. So I guess it would make sense for me to explain right now what it means to process. Yes, how does it work? So when we process target memories, we find very specific memories that happened in the past. Sometimes they are below a level of consciousness. And these memories, these target memories are what causes the current symptoms that our clients experience. So You know, a classic example is a client who is not doing well with authority. So let's say there's a boss that always triggers the client. And then the client goes to another job and there's still a boss that triggers the client. And as we look into the history, we find that something happened in the client's past. Maybe it was an interaction with a teacher or maybe dad was arrested by a police officer in the client's presence. And that memory has stuck with the client in its original form. Meaning that when the client faces a trigger, for example, the boss, 20 years, 30 years, sometimes 40 years later, the same raw emotions are being triggered. And that happens because the memory itself was not processed. Now, memories tend to get processed. If everything goes well, our brain has a mechanism to process memories. So that happens, a lot of it happens when we sleep with eye movement. So when you think about RAM, the rapid eye movement, And EMDR, the the EM of RAM is the same EM of EMDR. So we're using that same mechanism that our brains use during a sleep to process memories. And when we do that, what happens is that memories that used to feel present, even if they were below the level of consciousness, all of a sudden being filed in the brain as something that happened in the past. So sometimes after an EMDR session, the client will go to work. If we're going back to the same example with, you know, being triggered by the boss, do a few EMDR sessions, and then they'll go to work and the boss will no longer be a trigger. And that's the beauty of EMDR because we're addressing the core of what causes the symptoms. We're not only targeting the symptoms, which is what we do a lot in different types of therapy. We target that core and then we process it. So it's finding the source. And at the time when it originally happened, for whatever reason, you didn't process it properly. It didn't get filed away into an appropriate category. And it just kind of stayed dormant until a similar situation arose where you responded the same way the first time, correct? Correct. That's exactly right. Yes. So using that example, how does EMD work? What do you do to find the source and to put it to rest finally? Okay, that's a good question. And the answer is not that simple. So we have different ways to get to memory. Sometimes the clients remember the memory and it's an explicit memory. So it's something that they remember exactly what happened. So, you know, a classic example of that is a client that had a car accident. So let's say that life was good enough. There were no mental health symptoms. And then client had a car accident and then symptoms started. That sometimes happened. Full-blown post-traumatic stress disorder. The client has flashbacks. They can drive. They have nightmares. They get hypervigilant if they see something that slightly reminds them of a car accident. Their nervous system responds to it. So when that happens, we have relatively easy work to process the memory. 
But sometimes the memory is stored in the brain below the level of consciousness in the limbic system. These are areas of the brain that don't really understand language and linear thinking. And sometimes the older memories are stored in these parts of the brain. So we have ways to activate these parts of the brain. And when I say activate, I mean it. We're activating the memory. So sometimes it can feel intense in sessions. But the result is that these memories, once we're done processing, they're, again, being filed as something that just happened in the past instead of being something that constantly feeling present. See, when you talk about the intense emotion, it's as if they're reliving the experience originally. Is that what you mean? I would say reprocessing instead of reliving. Uh, we're activating in the memory. So they are experiencing what we call dual attention. And that's a big part of EMDR therapy. So the client needs to be able to experience what happened in the past while at the same time maintaining present awareness. And that's what we call dual awareness. We have a famous saying in EMDR that we hold one foot in the present and one foot in the past. So the client is able to look at what happened while they're maintaining the awareness that they're here and now in my office and they're safe. So it's sort of as if they're looking at it objectively from a bird's eye view. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Where does the eye movement part play a role? How does that work? Uh, that's a good question, Laura. So initially when EMDR was developed, it was only done with eye movements. And that's the most well-researched method of what we call bilateral stimulation. But now we have different ways of performing bilateral stimulation. Uh, some of them are done through technological tools. So client holds two buzzers that vibrate and they go from side to side. And the idea is that they activate both hemispheres of the brain. And then we have some tapping that we do. And, you know, during COVID, we increased the frequency of using tapping because it was just more available as we started doing EMDR virtually over Zoom or other applications online. Uh, but back to your question, Laura, eye movement is the most researched form of bilateral stimulation in EMDR. And that helps the brain to process these memories. Do you need to have specific equipment to do EMDR to measure what's going on physiologically? Yeah, good question. And the answer is yes and no. Most EMDR therapists have some equipment that they use. We were using some light bars and these buzz buzzers that I mentioned. So the light bars has lights that go back and forth and the client tracks the light with their eyes as they instructed by the therapists while they're focusing on certain aspects of the disturbing memories. So that's one form of technological tool. And what happened during COVID, we've seen an increase in web-based applications that basically do the same thing. So now I can do EMDR therapy with a client who they all they need is a laptop or a desktop computer. So it's not going to work on a phone. It's not big enough because their eyes need to move back and forth with, you know, the full range of the eyes. But we can definitely do it over a computer. And now we even have preliminary research that shows that EMDR done virtually is as effective as EMDR that is done in person. Oh, that makes it very convenient and accessible for many, many people then. Right. So for example, I live in Colorado and we have a lot of rural communities that don't have access to, or in the past didn't have access to therapy. So I had not heard of EMDR. I had heard it, but I didn't really know what it was. And I 
in looking up my questions for you, I wanted to have this interview so that we could explain it to a larger audience. And I actually know people who were very curious about this in, when I told them I was going to be interviewing you. They wanted to know how they could get it for themselves. Is it expensive? Is it readily available? Does insurance cover it? Can you answer questions like that? Yes, absolutely. So how much it costs, it would depend on the therapists that are in your area. So generally speaking, as therapists, we can only treat people who are in our state or where we are licensed. So I'm, I live in Colorado. I'm licensed in Colorado. So I would say to these people who are looking for EMDR therapy to just look for specifically EMDR therapy in their state. And, you know, one way to do it is through the EMDR International Association. They have a therapist directory or psychology today, which is the biggest therapy directory. And then they have filters there and you can put EMDR and the price range like every therapy. And also the therapist's specialty and experience and which usually is correlated as in any field right right yes. right it's it's a specialty there you have to be specially trained in this area to do this therapy correct right absolutely so you can't just read a book and do emdr you have to be specially trained and within emdr there are some subspecialties so for example some emdr therapists are specializing in helping clients with childhood trauma, other EMDR therapists specialize in addictions, and there are some other subspecialties. If your insurance covers therapy, mental health therapy, is this within that spectrum usually, or is it considered a very special specialty not subject to your insurance in your experience? Yeah, that, no, that's a good question. So now... EMDR is covered by insurance. Uh, 30 years ago, it was considered some kind of an esoteric approach that the mainstream, even mainstream therapy looked at EMDR therapists and, you know, kind of asked, what is this thing that therapists do moving their finger? That's how it started, by the way. You asked me about technology. So it started with EMDR therapists moving their fingers back and forth the problem was that they got shoulder pain, so that's why the these technological tools were developed. Were they using their fingers in front of the patient's eyes so that the eyes would track the fingers? Exactly. So uh -huh. that's how it started. That was the beginning of EMDR. And again, there was not a lot of research when it started, too. Now we have mountains of research that show the efficacy of EMDR, and we have organizations like the World Health Organization and the VA and many other organizations that recognize the efficacy of EMDR. Now, you had a personal experience with it yourself, correct? You went into therapy not to be an EMDR therapist. You went in to be a mental health therapist and counselor, and then you discovered it on your own. What was your personal experience with it that really made you uh, excited about it? Well, I have to say that it has been my experience, but it's also, as I talk with more and more EMDR therapists, that's kind of the experience that a lot of EMDR therapists have. It's a wow experience because as therapists, we're trained to think that change has to take a very long time in therapy. Not to get the wrong impression that EMDR is always a quick fix, that you go and, you know, you do a few sessions and it fixes all your problems, but it has the potential to reduce and sometimes, in a lot of cases, if it's done right, eliminate the symptoms in a relatively short period of time. And when I saw that, I decided that that is going to be my specialty. Yeah, it's because you're a helper and a healer. And that's what we ultimately want to do is help somebody overcome something that's been a wall for them for a while. What kind of issues does it help with? You said childhood traumas, PTSD, yeah. and addictions. Yeah, yeah. Depression, and anxiety, um, obsessive compulsive disorder. Basically, everything that can bring a client into our therapy room and, you know, I've been talking with 
people who have done EMDR for 30 years and it's been shown to be helpful with uh, phantom limb pain, for example, um, chronic pain, things that initially we didn't even think about because we're in the mental health field. Uh, but we have research that shows that actually in the case of phantom limb pain, this is the most effective treatment for people who had an, a limb amputated and kept having this pain, EMDR is the most effective treatment for that. This has just been absolutely fascinating. And it's really encouraging to know that there is something else out there. If traditional other ways have not helped, here's something else that may be the solution for whatever has been bothering you. Thank you, Rotem, so much for coming on and explaining this. And please tell us where we can find out a little bit more about you and what you do. Yeah, so I treat people in the Denver area. So I have a private practice. And I also have my platform, which is the art and science of EMDR. And people can just Google the art and science of EMDR, where I provide information and I interview authors and experts in the field of EMDR. And that's where I find uh, a lot of the interesting information and have really interesting and insightful conversations with all kinds of like-minded therapists. Thank you very much for what you're doing. Thanks for helping this world. And thanks for coming on the show and teaching my audience more about this. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Rotem. Thank you. We live in an era where people have more awareness and care for their mental health more than ever before. I hope that this talk about EMDR might be a doorway that'll lead you on the path to a more healed and happy version of you. Rotem has a platform called The Art and Science of EMDR to educate EMDR therapists, and he just started a community for therapists so that they can connect, grow, and share all their knowledge that they have about EMDR. If you would like to share this episode or find any of the links for Rotem Brayer, check out the show notes at howtolife.com slash 098. If mental health is interesting to you, you might find these other shows helpful as well. You can learn about tips to balance your emotions in episode eight. Learn how to end chronic stress and burnout in episode 61. Episode 62 is about breaking the cycle of your past and episode 70 is just lovely, and it's about how to eliminate habitual negative self-talk through the dialogue of self-liberation. I love all of these episodes, and I think you will too. There will be the links for all of these shows, plus I will link the EMDR International Society directory so that you can find a certified therapist in your area. And again, it will all be in the show notes on my website, howtolife.com slash 098. Thanks for listening to this show today, and thank you for all of your support. I really appreciate you guys. I appreciate the reviews and the kind words. Thank you. Please give this podcast a five-star rating if you haven't already, and subscribe so that you never miss a show. I will be back again next Tuesday for more good instruction, inspiration, and insight. There is lots more good stuff coming your way. Take care, everybody. Be kind to yourself. Love yourself. Heal yourself. You're finding your way and you're doing a great job. It is all good. And you got this.